Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy John Quincy Adams The little boy who became our sixth president led a life not at all like that of any other of the boys whom you have read. His father was John Adams, our second president, and when, on July 11th, 1767, little John Quincy Adams was born in the old home at Braintree, Massachusetts, his great father was already speaking bravely for his country's rights in the city of Boston. In 1772 the family moved to Boston, and little John, for two years, saw, as the other boys did, the British soldiers in their bright red coats on parade in the Boston streets, and heard on all sides talk of war with England. He saw a little of real war too, for when he was eight years old his mother took him on top of a high hill called Bemis Hill, from which he saw the smoke and heard the roar of cannon in that awful battle of Bunker Hill. When, in 1776, the British left Boston, this little lad of nine years used to often ride on horseback in and out of the city to bring home the latest news. This was a ride of twenty-two miles from the old home at Braintree, where Mrs. Adams had gone when her husband went to Congress, and I think it took a pretty brave and strong boy to ride all those long miles alone. When John Adams went to France to try and get her aid for America, he took with him his little boy, then ten years old. It was a rough, hard trip, for not only were there fierce winds which lashed the waves into fury, but they were chased by British ships, for England did not want John Adams to get this help from France. But they reached Paris in safety, and little John was at once put in a French school. He only stayed for about a year and went back home with his father in the spring. Now for three months he was with his mother, and then in November he and some other boys who were placed in his father's care all started for France, where they were to be put in a good school. This trip was harder than the other one, for the big ship, Sensible, sprang a leak, and after some days of great peril they were glad to go to the nearest land, which was Spain, and now there was a long, hard trip by land before France could be reached. They had sailed on November 13th, 1779, and it was not until February 5th, 1780, that the little party reached Paris. For two years now our little lad was hard at work with his books in Paris. Then his father was sent to the Netherlands as American minister, and he took his little son there and placed him in a school in Amsterdam. From here he went to the university at Leiden, where he stayed until July 1781. He was now only 14 years old. But you see, he had been in so many lands that he could speak as the folks did in those strange lands, and this was a rare thing in those days. In 1781, Francis Dana, then the American minister to Russia, needing someone to help him in his work, sent to Leyden for this young boy. They passed through Germany on the way to Russia, and here John Quincy learned something of another new land. Then, after a year in Russia, he left Mr. Dana and studied for a year in Sweden. The next spring he went to his father in Holland, and then went to Paris with him, and was present when the Treaty of Peace between England and America ended the War of Independence. For two years more he studied abroad, and then sailed for home in May 1783. He at once entered the junior class at Harvard College, and graduated with next to the highest honours in 1787. Then he took up law, as his father had done, and began to practice in Boston. He made few friends. Folks did not love him as they had either Madison or Monroe, but he was always known to be a man of great power and of great learning, and knowing so much of other lands, he was just the man to be sent as American minister to these countries. In 1794, Washington sent him to Holland, and in 1796, he was sent to Berlin. When in 1801, Adams came back home, it was to find new honours waiting for him. He was sent first to the State Senate and then to Congress. You see, the steps by which our presidents rose to power were much the same in every case. A duty well done in a small place led to something a little higher, and so on to the greatest honour of all, the president's chair. The state of Massachusetts was very proud of John Quincy Adams. Not only was he a great statesman and the son of the man whom they all loved, but he was as well a fine scholar and a brilliant speaker. In 1809 he was sent abroad again for his country, this time to Russia, where he had not been since he was a boy of fourteen. In 1815 he was sent to France, but he was here only a few months, when war broke out in France, and all the ministers from other countries were called away. He went at once to England, and here he had a much more pleasant time than his father had when he went there as the first American minister. The United States was now known as a big strong country, and no one dared to be rude to her minister. 
in eighteen seventeen his own land felt the need of the great man who had served her so well abroad and he was called home to become secretary of state no man was so well fitted for this post as he for there were many men from the lands across the sea now coming and going in the capital of the united states to talk over great questions there were new states coming into the union and other lands were always trying to gain a little power here so john quincy adams who not only was a great scholar and a fine lawyer but also knew well so many lands besides his own was just the man to help president monroe through his eight years of work he was also the man best suited for the president's chair at the end of monroe's term of office not once while adam was in washington working hard did he forget his old father watching in his home at quincy the busy life of his great son once every year he went to the quiet old home and told his father of the life in washington in which the older man had once held so great a place at the age of sixty-eight adams went back to his home in quincy but in eighteen thirty once more he was sent to congress and for sixteen years he kept his seat there he grew old and grey serving his native land he made bitter enemies but many warm friends he feared no one and his voice was always for the freedom of this great land on november nineteenth eighteen forty six he had a stroke of paralysis while walking in boston but three months later saw him again in washington and taking his old seat in congress as the grey old man came feebly into the hall every man present rose to his feet and so stood until he took his seat he was too weak now to talk and only once more did he try to speak his mind on one of the great questions of the day this was on february twenty first eighteen forty eight he rose to speak but fell into the arms of a man near him at once they took him into a cloak-room and sent for his wife for two days did he lay there and then on the morning of february twenty third his great soul took its flight his last words were this is the last of life and i am content End of chapter 6